Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Paul Mathias, and I am the Senior Program Manager for OOI, Ocean Observatories Initiative. Um, this morning, for the next hour, uh, we'll be hearing from Joel Brock, who's the Director of CHESS, Krista Larson, who's the Assistant Director of Administration and Strategic Implementation at NCAR, uh, Dan Stanzione, the Associate Vice President for Research at University of Texas and the Executive Director of the TAC. And online we have Dan uh, Zayner, who is the Facility Scheduling and Operations Coordinator for NERI. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to briefly introduce uh, each of our facilities and talk through some lessons learned. And uh, we're going to just move through each of our presentations and conclude with an opportunity for hopefully some time for your questions. We'll be covering a lot of ground and lessons learned from a, quite a broad spectrum, I think you'll see, of um, elements of uh, operations management. So the uh, OI vision to set the context is um, really to turn the, the paradigm for ocean research on its ear, right? So instead of the historical approach to oceanography, you know, uh, arranging for a ship to be deployed for two weeks to a certain part of the oceans and coming back to shore and processing the data within a single university or institution. The OOI provides uh, uh, several fixed observatories in the oceans that are providing data to anyone worldwide with an internet connection. So today you can download uh, up, uh, nearly a decade's worth of data from these observatories in the uh, deep oceans that uh, the data is served by a, a common cyber infrastructure. Uh, there are over 800 instruments aboard this infrastructure and the infrastructure or the observatories in the oceans consist of fixed moorings and also moving uh, assets, underwater gliders and AUVs that are remotely controlled from shore. It serves six interdisciplinary uh, science themes uh, including um, uh, gathering information related to global warming and ocean acidification and carbon uptake. And the program has a planned life of 25 years. So it's one of 32 NSF facilities. Many of those are represented here. It's one of three in the ocean sciences, along with the research fleet or the UNALS vessels and the IODP, that's the drilling program. So right now we're ending the year four of five for the second major award uh, phase. And we're funded at 44 million per year, uh, thus far a flat budget. So a quick snapshot of the history uh, of the OOI. Initially funded in 2009, it was managed by uh, a PMO at the Consortium for Ocean Leadership in Washington, DC for about nine years. Uh, that's what we refer to as OOI 1.0. And OOI uh, 1.0, we commissioned all of the observatories in 2016. Um, they were accepted uh, and commissioned by the NSF. And then uh, in 2018, or four years ago, uh, there uh, was an opportunity that uh, Hui took to assume the PMO role. And that's when I became program manager for, uh, for the program. That's what we refer to as OI 2.0. Uh, and last year, we had a mid-award review that led to a recommendation to renew uh, rather than recompete uh, the next phase, which is referred to as OI 2.5. We put the final touches and pressed the button for our proposal for the next five year phase to begin in 2023 uh, last Friday. Uh, just a quick snapshot view of some of the at sea operations to give you an idea of the size uh, of the operation. Some of these moorings are quite large. Um, and hefty, so they require the largest uh, class of, of ship to deploy and recover. Uh, like NEON, uh, we deploy and recover these observatories using two sets of equipment. While one set is deployed at sea and collecting and transmitting data to shore via satellite or via cable, another set is onshore being refurbished and repaired and, and made ready uh, to deploy. Uh, so the onshore operations, you can see some of the elements here. We have high bay activities. Uh, we have calibration and test activities. Uh, actually quite a bit in common for those of you that went through the uh, NEON tour or heard some of the NEON uh, discussion. Uh, we do have similar uh, 
uh, flow for uh, our instrumentation to repair and uh, replace as needed and conduct uh, calibrations. This lower photograph on the lower right are just some of the elements of one of the observatories, the Pioneer Observatory. So I joined uh, Hui and OI uh, as a contractor initially 11 years ago, and I was the lead systems engineer for just the Hui component. I moved from there over the next few years to be the program manager for the CGSN Hui component. And four years ago, I became the program manager for the entire OOI. So the lessons learned that I'm going to try and move swiftly through are based on experiences and observations from that entire uh, experience in 11 years. So organizational structure, uh, there's a lot to be said. I could probably consume an hour talking about it, but I think some of the key elements and lessons learned are the idea of an upward and outward PI and an inward and downward PM. And what that means is perhaps obvious, but that the, the PI and the program uh, who I worked with at the start of OI 2.0 viewed his role as interfacing with the NSF primarily uh, and engaging at the community level for the program and uh, managing and working with the other PIs at the other institutions. While the PM role is looking down, tracking the cost and schedule, making sure that the deliverables are of satisfactory quality and so forth. Um, my experience and background is not just in program management, uh, but also I have some uh, subject matter expertise in, um, in acoustics and underwater uh, and oceanography. So having that combination, I think, versus uh, just uh, uh, program management skills, I feel is a lesson learned for adding value uh, to this uh, particular program. And then establishing uh, roles and responsibilities and really clearly defining uh, roles for uh, positions within the organization is essential. Um, it's easy, I think, at academic institutions to per potentially consider bringing in or applying uh, uh, potential candidates to a role in a program, uh, maybe not necessarily thinking through first, what are the roles and responsibilities that I need to fill, and then try to match that uh, uh, individual at, or find the right individual to, to, to meet that. So that's uh, another um, uh, lessons learned. We have a lot of reporting and communication, Mark Warner mentioned yesterday, and other programs that I've uh, reviewed and, and uh, been made aware of. Communication is, is, a, is a recurring problem in these large programs. Uh, people are maybe not sure who they're responsible to or how they fit inside the program. So communications is a, uh, is a, is a thing to really invest in. And our approach is we have both ad hoc types of uh, communication. We use uh, Slack and other uh, types of online asynchronous uh, communication tools. And we hold weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual uh, reviews as well as uh, in the hallway. Uh, and through, uh, uh, through Zoom and other communication means. Uh, established program metrics is essential. Uh, we have a range described here. For more information about some of our metrics, there is a poster upstairs on the second floor uh, that does uh, talk through some of those. And then sub-award monitoring. I've just taken a snapshot of uh, what we refer to as tracking books. When we were hosted uh, at uh, University of Texas, I gave a talk just on tracking books. I think they're an outstanding tool that uh, uh, we actually stole from uh, a defense contractor and made it our own. Uh, it gives us a chance to review every month with our subawardees their progress uh, and performance to plan. And uh, I'd be happy to talk in more detail about that uh, if anyone were interested outside of this presentation. And then finally, uh, some lessons learned from engineering. You know, risk and opportunity management really is a, is a, a must do. It's not a should do. Starts at the beginning, goes throughout the whole life cycle. Uh, it's not just for construction, but it's also for operations and management. Gives you an opportunity to document the thinking at the time associated with risks. And it also, um, uh, you know, represents uh, uh, your current uh, uh, risk envelope that, that you're carrying. Change control and configura configuration management, essential tools, and again, an opportunity for participation by stakeholders in changes that will occur during the life of the program. Requirements management, again, another tool that is not just for construction, but it's for throughout the life cycle. Uh, 
We conduct quarterly data-driven reviews. This is another lessons learned. You know, we have uh, areas of the program that emerge as uh, areas that maybe aren't uh, perhaps as mature as we might like or are needing some uh, you know, detailed evaluation. So we've arranged uh, uh, through the lead systems engineer, we have arranged for the program to undergo these quarterly data-driven reviews that are very focused on specific topics like uh, tech refresh and obsolescent equipment. And uh, the uh, uh, process documentation, uh, another lessons learned for us is how essential it is to update and upgrade and refresh and keep your PEP, keep your CONOPS, keep your SEMP and all your other associated core program documents have to be current. They have to be updated and that has to be part of the plan. And then finally, uh, as a shout out and a kickoff to another poster, uh, the capability maturity mod um, uh, model which is uh, shown, uh, the summary table is shown here. I'm not gonna talk through all of this, but it establishes our systems engineering processes down the left side, the kinds of things that we manage as part of our uh, uh, program engineering effort and reporting effort, uh, and uh, uh, how we set forth over time, which is the x-axis, uh, how we set forth milestones to make them more robust, make them more, uh, uh, aligned with and uh, strengthen them uh, for their applicability to the program. That's the capability maturity model. And there is a poster uh, upstairs that uh, if you were interested to find out more. <clears throat> so with that, I'd like to turn over the floor to Joel Brock, uh, director of CHESS. Thanks, Paul. I think from the... A, a good kick in that I'm the PI and the, and the director of chess. And so it's more of an upward and outward look. And so, so we go to the next slide. So let me give you a brief introduction to chess where the, it stands for Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. Uh, so, uh, it's a non-technical audience here. So all you need to know is that X-rays are light. The synchrotron is a very brilliant light bulb. Uh, so if you compare a candle to the stadium lights at a stadium, that's the right idea. Okay, so, oh, and in some of the details on the right, you know, we're actually a, a huge facility. We live underneath the uh, central campus of Cornell University. We're five stories underground, uh, and it's a, uh, a large particle accelerator. Or we're funded by multiple partners. Or so NSF is one of them, uh, Department of Defense and National Institute of Health, New York State are others. Our annual budget is about a quarter, or $25 million a year. We have about 240 employees and a matrix. And we serve about 1,000 users a year. Our, our, we began our current model in 2019. We've been operating since uh, it just began in 1980, but the current uh, uh, incarnation began in 2019. And we operate a sub-facility for the National Science Foundation known as CHEX, and we also have a, um, that's the operations one, we have a, a mid-scale two award to build a new high magnetic field facility in collaboration with the National Magnet Lab and the University of Puerto Rico. So our, our current partner, as I mentioned, is the National Science Foundation, Air Force Research Laboratory, and the National Institutes of Health. Combined, they fund a total of seven X-ray uh, experimental stations or beam lines, and, and they're, they're listed there. But I won't go into the details of which one is which. Next slide, yeah. If you're interested in the details, they're on this slide, and you can download it later. They cover um, uh, all kinds of uh, materials, biology, and uh, 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 things of interest, uh, uh, failure analysis for the Air Force, let's call it that. So our lessons learned, and this is the upward and outward looking part. A huge part of my role is interfacing with all of our partners, our funding partners. Uh, and there's things you need to know when you're running a facility. And that, the first one is that the NSF is really well optimized to support uh, discipline-based individual investigator awards. Then they do a fantastic job at that. It's just by far. If you've ever dealt with uh, basic energy sciences at DOE, you know how good NSF is. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but there are some constraints then for the large facilities that they, they're limited to five-year awards. 
as, as you have to spend it to zero at the end. It goes out for a detailed science review each time, so you have to look new, deliver unique capabilities every time. And you need to develop a funding strategy to uh, develop uh, infrastructure costs as you come obsolescent. So, you know, remember we've been there for 40 years. Things are, you know, those of us who are over 40 know that not everything lasts for forever. <laughs> so, so there are other challenges, and some of these are being dealt with, uh, but, you know, things to deal with, you know, is, is inflation changes, that these five-year awards are typically flat funded. Uh, historically, we didn't have the ability to have contingency in our operating awards. And so the, uh, the only way you could uh, deal with that was to delay your capital purchase at the beginning of the award or then slide everything forward and then the program director would wink at you as you bought capital in the last year of your award with the anticipation that you'd be renewed. So there are ways to deal with it, but it, you know, it, it's nice to move on to a more uh, organized structure and that's happening. There are also then challenges of there's the known knowns and the unknown knowns. So the, you know, I confess, when we submitted our last operating awards, we didn't imagine a worldwide pandemic. My bad. Okay, <laughs> but it's a reality in there, and so you know, how, how to deal with that in the operating awards. The next big challenge is a facility like Chess is multidisciplinary, okay, so that some facilities are funded. Uh, telescope tends to come from a single division in the Science Foundation, and so on. You can track them. There are a handful of them, however, they're truly multidisciplinary. We have users from every uh, di directorate in the foundation and, and trying to broaden the support across that. Uh, so the good news, really good, and I give the large facilities people credit, came up with mechanisms for funding projects across multiple divisions and how do you review a project, how do you budget it, how do you manage it, and so on. Um, that is, capability is just beginning to get developed in uh, the operations realm. Um, um, and so um, the facility leadership has to work very closely with division directors, assistant directors. And you have to have these discussions years ahead of time. Otherwise, there, there's literally no mechanism to submit the proposal. Okay, so uh, these things that the foundation is working on it and so on, but it's still a work in progress. Uh, I, I'll stop it. I think that's my last slide. Thanks, Thanks Joel. And uh, Krista? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much. So, uh, earlier this week, actually, in his welcome talk, uh, Scott McIntosh, the deputy director of NCAR, gave you all a fuller view of NCAR. So, I've just got a few bullet points here that I wanted to highlight. Um, so, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, NCAR is what's referred to as a federally funded research and development center, or an FFRDC. Uh, and we're dedicated to the study of the atmosphere, the Earth system, and the sun. Uh, and the original, one of the original reasons behind the creation of NCAR was to provide the atmospheric and the earth science research community with the facilities, support, and the research capabilities that a single university might not otherwise have. And I'll, I'll say more about that uh, in the coming slides. Um, so really what we're here to do is we provide a long-term basic and applied research and development, or R&D, expertise, leadership, management and science support to the entire Earth system user community on behalf of our sponsor, NSF. Uh, so one of the things we really look at is, is our mission here at NCAR fully aligned with the mission of our primary sponsor, the National Science Foundation? Um, and with the guidance from NSF and with our broader scientific community, we operate in the public interest under what we call open skies, uh, providing scientific access to the broader community. Um, next slide. Um, so one of the things that is a hallmark of many decades uh, uh, during which NCAR has been in operation is providing research infrastructure, both development and support to the larger community. Um, so I've highlighted a few things here. Uh, in the past, um, there are a couple of large projects that we've undertaken here. Uh, one of these is the rather lengthy acronym, a High Performance Instrumented Airborne Platform for Environmental Research, or HYPER. Uh, it's now known as the NSF NCAR G5. This was actually one of the first MREFC projects many years ago. Um, I had the privilege of serving as the HYPER project director. Uh, we were able to deliver that project under budget in 2005. Uh, in 2012, we delivered another large project that was funded by um, uh, NSF. Uh, this was the design, construction, and commissioning uh, of the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center project. And I can't recall if you all got it. Some of you may have gotten a chance to visit with it, but that's a, or visit the facility that's located up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, and that takes us to the present. 
a uh, couple large projects uh, that have been proposed. Uh, one is the Airborne Phased phase Array Radar, or APAR. Uh, this was in development for many, many years in the uh, NCAR Earth Observing Laboratory. Uh, it's been a very active partnership and a very productive partnership uh, between NSF and also NOAA. NOAA supported the preliminary design development for APAR, uh, and we are currently under review as part of the MSRI2 process. Uh, and another project uh, is the Coronal Solar Magnetism Observatory, or COSMO. Uh, and this is to build um, a observa large observatory to study uh, solar weather, to contribute to the study of solar weather. This is right now, NSF has funded uh, what we call the COSMO Site and Design Advancement, or the CASADA project, uh, that is currently underway. And a big part of CASADA uh, are two primary deliverables, one of which is the conduct of a site survey to identify our top two candidate locations uh, for co construction and operation of COSMO, and also design of what we call the LC, the Large Coronagraph Telescope, which is a very unique telescope that's a primary component. Um, so these are targeted projects, but the other thing that I want to emphasize here is in addition to execution of these targeted large-scale infrastructure projects, NCAR has a long multi-decadal tradition of providing facility support to the community uh, via ground and airborne research platforms, high-performance computing and data archival and analysis resources, and via a number of community models uh, that are developed here, but also in really close partnership with the broader community. Next slide, please. Um, so what I want to talk about is looking at this both from a management and how we transition these facilities to the operations phase. Uh, one of the things that, that I see and my colleagues and I see uh, as essential is integration. How we integrate our efforts internally, but also how we integrate what we're doing with the larger community. Um, and actually, if you, if you take a look and you read through the NCAR strategic plan for 2020 to 2024, you'll see integration talked about a lot. That's a hall hallmark of, of the new strategic plan, or I should say the newish strategic plan. Um, so what we are focused on, both in the directorate and across NCAR, is integration within and across the institution to build the high-performing teams that we need to propose implement and operate new research infrastructure. Uh, and so what we do here uh, is we work to identify and recruit individuals with necessary expertise, whether that's project management, proposal development, uh, award administration, et cetera, engineering, uh, from across our organization to join the project teams. Um, and in many cases, we try to do this as early as possible, beginning all the way back in the project and proposal development phases, we will try to build these integrated teams. The idea here is that, uh, I think as Scott McIntosh said, there are no lone wolf projects anymore. And I'll say more about that in a moment. And that's really true from our perspective. It's not a lone wolf in the sense of a project happening in a single lab. We need the expertise across all of the various labs and programs at NCAR and in UCAR, our parent organization, to be successful in these, these these big projects. Uh, and one thing we do and we have found to be uh, absolutely essential for these large projects and for the facilities we support for the community is we always try to ensure the engagement and the active involvement of operations personnel in the project development phase. So the greatest degree that we can when we're first conceiving of a project, for example, a project like APAR or years ago when we were working on the G5, a lot of our project team members were personnel who eventually would have responsibility for operating that platform. So what we're able to do in that process is we get the insights and perspectives and the ideas of those individuals who will eventually have to support that facility for the community so that they can inform not only how we're developing the project, but how we're executing it. And so we're always keeping an eye ahead toward what operations of that facility is going to be. Um, and the other thing that's important to our efforts here is integration with external partners on our project teams. Um, and this allows us to gain access to critical expertise and ideas, but also to ensure that we're broadening the impact. Uh, one of the things we think about whenever we're conceiving of or wanting to propose a new facility is, A, is this needed by the community that we support here at NCAR? And can, are we executing, are we planning and executing this project in such a manner that it is going to benefit the larger community? Um, I was thinking about the comment that the project manager made uh, about DCAS and how you always want to keep your eye on the project closeout. 
I think that was an excellent point. And the one thing I would tag onto that is whenever you're starting to think about a project, you always want to think about operations. Not just in the sense of the concept of operations and how are you going to materially, physically operate this, but how can you ensure that this uh, large facility, which is in many cases represents a significant investment of taxpayer dollars, how can you make sure that you are going to have a broad impact in the larger community? Uh, maybe in some cases with some of the developments we look at here beyond uh, not just the NSF community, but also a community beyond that. Um, and so what we try to do is we seek out and engage with university partners uh, as early as we can in our project development life cycle. Uh, and we look for ways that we can create opportunities for a two-way exchange of ideas and promote capacity building in the community. Uh, and this isn't just NCAR trying to impact the, the community, the university community. We look for ways that they can have an impact on us and on how we conduct our business here, our, our operations here at NCAR. We also actively look uh, to build partnerships with private industry and other federal agencies. Uh, and this allows us to leverage additional resources, not only to construct these assets, but also to mo multiply the positive impact. Um, again, you know, quite often these large facilities are investments of significant taxpayer dollars. How can we ensure that we're actually broadening the impact such that the NSF scientific community of users benefits from these new facilities, but also if there are other sections of the community that benefit from these new facilities, we want to make sure we're engaging to make that happen as well. I think that's my last slide. Thanks, Krista. And Dan? Okay. Here, come on, I am. You don't have to stand and watch. Stand and watch. Have a seat, Paul. <laughs> Uh, so thanks very much um, for having me here. So I'm Dan Stanzione, and I run the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, and I am also the, the PI for our coming MREFC project that we will host. Uh, and I just did pictures of stuff instead of, oh, the background changed. And I think this is my only, yeah, uh, um, tax slide. So uh, although our... Uh, the leadership class computing facility is our official MREFC project, and we're in uh, final design on that right now. Um, we actually have a very long history of building and operating big instruments for the NSF, not through the large facilities program, um, up to and including Frontera there, which is a $60 million class machine just for the hardware acquisition. Um, Stampede 2, which is still in production, $30 million class machine, and going back all the way to Ranger in 2006, um, awarded 2006. Um, so for the last 16 years we've been doing, uh, you know, TAC has existed for 21 years, we've been doing sort of big NSF infrastructure projects for 16 of those. Um, and, you know, now with Horizon will be the next machine, um, our fifth sort of leadership class system, um, but will be the first in the MREFC program. So, uh, and collectively across these machines, we actually serve a lot of your projects. We have data from OOI. Um, we work with tons of researchers from NCAR um, on various models and things. And, uh, um, you know, for whatever the cyber infrastructure component of your facility is, you may, you know, likely uh, interface with us somewhere. We put out about 7 billion compute hours per year, um, core hours. We store 200-ish petabytes of data almost exclusively for NSF and NIH. Um, related stuff uh, in 12, 14 billion files I've lost track. So um, after a few billion you stop counting. So the, uh, at least by hand. Um, we also do host a component of one of the other large facilities, uh, the NERI, the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure. Uh, we host the Design Safe part of that, the cyber infrastructure piece. Um, third poster there uh, is the Design Safe poster and we've been involved in the software development for that for the last uh, we're in year eight, so seven and a half years, I believe. So, um, since we launched into that, so, um, so largely, uh, we're both uh, a facility in our own right, coming soon, but also a support facility to the rest of you in computing, data, networking, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and uh, that is a, a field where the timelines for the hardware decisions where. Currently, I believe everything vendors are saying for 24 months from now is a lie. Um, you know, you really get accurate performance information about nine months in advance. It works really well with a five-year planning process for uh, going through multiple stages of design and putting stuff in place. Um, in fact, I could probably write a book. It's not in my five minutes lessons learned on 
how to convince people you have a plan when you know it's all not true um, in terms of what the technology is going to do. So, um, because, yeah, you, you really know, I mean, I have really good insight about nine months before chip comes out of about how it's going to work. So, um, fortunately though, that's the easy part is the technology side of this. And so, um, also as a PI and, you know, so I suppose I'm in the upward and outward category by the Paul uh, um, classification. Um, but I think uh, Joel would agree that means we're actually uh, responsible for all of the outward and the inward. Um, and because we're responsible for everything, it means we're not really good at any of it. So um, that's what being a PI means at this point, right? Because an enormous amount of our time is spent on the proposal and project management type operations. Um, and less than we perhaps want on the, the cool science parts. But uh, um, so uh, I wanted to, and despite the fact that I both recognize and respect and spend a huge amount of my own personal time um, and recognize the importance of the sort of NSF management and project management, uh, WBS management pieces, you know, both the importance and the value of those things. Um, an important lesson for me has been um, separating, and by the way, I'm super fortunate to have a few people, my project direct, uh, manager, John West, uh, my financials people, Janet McCord, et cetera, um, who are just fantastic um, at this stuff and offload a ton of it. But, um, you know, keeping that separation between the technical people who actually want to do engineering and science um, and not burying them in process is a big part of the lesson. So um, for me, you know, having, you know, been in, high performance computing in one form or another for 30 years, uh, the technology part is really the easiest part of my job. Um, and in fact, the basic science part that the physics will progress has been the most predictable part of the job for like 50 years. Um, you know, we know transistors get smaller, we know the power improves because the physicists just do their magic and it, it happens, right? And now we're down to building things that are literally 30 atoms wide. Um, 30 silicon atoms across, right, to build transistors, um, which is sort of unthinkably complicated and everybody wants it in their smartphone for cat videos. But the, uh, um, but we can do that routinely. Um, the engineering usually follows with the occasional glitch. By the time you get to products and what succeeds in the market for big computers, that's a mess because it involves humans, right? So, uh, not physics. So, uh, and, you know, there's economic conditions, there's the actual marketing that distorts things um, inside the market, but really that's the, not the hard part either, right? The hard part of any research facility, I believe, is the people, right? Getting them, training them, and keeping great people. Um, you might imagine, you know, AI has done okay on the hype cycle and cloud and words like that and uh, attracting a little bit of private sector funding lately, so um, to the point where not only am I losing people to salaries where the delta is $200,000 a year um, between what I'm paying them and what they're getting, they also get things like $100,000 signing bonuses fairly routinely lately. So, um, you know, I've had people who leave for a salary starts with five and that's not in the 50s. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but there's the retention thing, but mostly it's about taking care of the people you have because we have a good work environment. Um, where uh, you don't hire a PhD scientist to spend their entire day doing WBS work, um, you know, you'll, you'll find good people to work with you. So, um, and the same with your external users um, and creating, you know, again, much harder than building a good supercomputer, building good relationships with big user teams um, to work on them, right, who have inordinately complex pieces of software and sometimes interesting ideas about how um, facilities should operate, um, you know, so, you know, it's not about the customer being always right in these cases, but you do want them to feel validated and heard and worked with in an intelligent way um, to make things happen. So the people management uh, is really the hard part. And frankly, you know, these big systems, even at $100 million of procurement, right, they're still in the last five or six years and then they're out the door, right? So computers come and go, the software lasts for decades, um, you will always have people and they're what matter. <laughs> so. Um, and I would say that the hardware is easy, it's worth saying a thing or two about software. Um, I think it's just roughly about a hundred times harder um, than dealing with hardware is software. Um, and the first mistake I think people make about this, and again, it's about people again, but software is not really a product. It's a living, breathing organism, right? It's not like buying a, you know, a, a hammer. It's like buying a horse, right? If you leave the horse in the barn for a few weeks and you don't do any care and feeding, it will be dead when you get back to it. Um, 
And software is exactly the same way. So there's constant care and feeding required. And I've been asked in, in many settings and talks, um, a lot of them around bioinformatics for some reason, but uh, um, you know, how long do you need to keep the developers on the software project once it's released? And I'm like, well, that's a really easy question in the software lifecycle. You figure out how long you actually want to use the software and you take away about the last two months and that's how long you need to have developers because somewhere in the three months after you get rid of your developers, something will change in the underlying ecosystem or a bug will be exploited or the requirements will change and that code will suddenly stop working and not be any good anymore. So, um, you know, really you're hiring developers and the software is just the sort of uh, sort of work product, but it's never actually done or finished. It's, a, it's an organism, right? Um, and in fact, when we think about software, and particularly when it intersects with project management, um, it's not even easy to define what software is. Um, so because there is uh, software you treat as procurement and sort of enterprise class, there's software you have to treat with, um, you know, great care and professional software engineering, but there's also a lot of other code that doesn't fall into those categories and how you sort of manage and categorize that, right? So um, you know, one good taxonomy I'm seeing is like, is this a code that is only run by the person who wrote it? No one else is ever going to see it. Um, or is the code run only by people? And this is pretty common, particularly there's a lot of boutique, say, astrophysics codes that fit this uh, um, category, right, where the developer's on a first name basis with everyone who's ever going to run it, right? So, um, you know, 40, 50 people around the world. Um, because in, you know, there's what, eight, nine hundred practicing astronomers and they have 35 different applications. So um, you can figure out the average size of a user community from that pretty easily, right? So uh, so do, in these cases where it's a very small system, do we really want to burden it with all of modern software engineering? Do you need a separate unit test and system test group? I mean, for a lot of the code you're writing, um, that may not actually be appropriate, right? <laughs> Just to apply this sort of enterprise project management to it. So, um, because it's a good way to turn a $100,000 project into a $4 million project and get probably worse output. In fact, uh, um, um, there's been some work on this on what's called the ninja code gap, which is the difference in performance um, from, uh, you know, having an, a naive programmer implement something versus what an expert programmer can really do. Uh, and in performance, this doesn't count the time to build it, which has a whole number factor difference. The, the difference in performance is not a percentage, it's a factor of 24. Um, so when you get your monthly $20,000 bill for running on the cloud, think about the fact that with better software you could divide that by 20 every month forever. So, um, so taking care of those software people is also it. So to me, it's, uh, an amazing amount is making sure that um, while my project management team is on top of everything, we have our baseline costs and our monthly updates and all of the reporting that um, not all of my scientists and engineers in the field are spending every week on that. <laughs> They're spending it on uh, the things that matter to them. And so, uh, so last slide and last minute here, I'm sure I'm over time, but the, uh, uh, for us, um, because you notice we have very different machines than say the Department of Energy buys um, for leadership. One reason is, you know, for the exascale machines that are coming live in the DOE right now, they spend a billion dollars um, on the software side to get 30 codes ready, right? So 30, 35 million dollars per code um, to port over. Uh, in the NSF space, we're just not in that environment, right? You know, every NCAR code doesn't get 30 million every five years to port um, <laughs> uh, to the new version of it. So um, for us, we have codes drive the selection of machines, not the other way around. Um, you know, th if we, we could build more performance systems that most of you couldn't use, and uh, those, that unexploited performance is just not valuable. Um, but at the same time, we do have to make progress on codes, right? So, and that's that factor of 24 thing. But if you're running on a $100 million machine and you're using less than 1% of the effective uh, performance of that machine, that's not a good story for us to tell the taxpayers. Um, and in fact, that one just never goes on a congressional briefing slide. Um, but it happens an awful lot of the time. So, uh, and given that we're now running machines, the next one is going to be at 15 megawatts, running them at 1% of their effective capacity um, is sort of an environmental disaster as well. So people, software, systems are easy. <laughs> and is Dan on? Thanks, Dan. Uh, we're not quite ready for questions yet, but we are ready for Dan Zayner, who I hope and think is on the phone. Dan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. All right. Uh, looks like you're up, Dan. Go ahead. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. So uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, Dan Zayner from Purdue University, uh, although I'm joining you from uh, 
Eugene, Oregon, where we recently moved. So thanks for allowing me to join virtually uh, instead of making the, the trek over to Boulder. Appreciate it. Um, I've been with NERI, the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure, uh, our network coordination office, or the NCO, for our six years of operations as our facility scheduling and operations coordinator. So I'm the guy who wrangles all the cats. Um, and big thanks to Dan Sanzio and the team at TAC, as well as all the rest of our NERI teammates here on, on this slide. It just shows how big our network is. So we've been in existence for, for six years, the, the network coordination office has. Uh, as Dan mentioned, TAC was a little bit before that to get our cyber infrastructure up and running. Uh, as NERI, we came out of, uh, we were the successor program to NIS. Some of you may be familiar with that, but we, with the advent of NERI, we've added in wind engineering. Now we've also begun to add in social science components uh, like the Converge Center at uh, Colorado Boulder and going to be adding in a uh, niche, which combines wind and uh, water and wave and surge events all together in one facility. So we're a, a large network with a diverse set of components doing large scale physical testing, field deployments, creating code and huge amounts of data and simul simulations as well as hybrid simulations so combining numerical modeling with physical testing and with all that we've learned a few things i want to share with you today uh, first is just the, the amount of projects is not always indicative of the amount of work that is going on yes we have had over 125 nsf funded projects in our first years of operation during our previous award we're now uh, in year two of our renewal. But one of our projects here that you're seeing, uh, this is a two-story wooden structure at the University of California, San Diego, their shake table. They're currently building a 10-story version of this, and it takes anywhere from four to seven months just for the construction of that project. And so many of these 125 NSF projects are on that order of magnitude that takes months and sometimes up to a year to construct. Uh, so we have very large physical projects, as well as our numerical and, and combination hybrid projects. We'd like to also highlight that over 60% of the research PIs from these projects are from institutions outside of the institution that is uh, doing the testing. So it uh, just shows the depth and breadth of our network and that there's no playing favorites. There's no um, you know keeping an instrument to yourself in our network. And that's one of the main hallmarks of our centralized scheduling system. The biggest lesson learned here is uh, has come from, I don't know how many of you were here a few years ago when uh, my friend Larry Yatch, who is a retired Navy SEAL, presented to the NSF within, it was the Large Facilities Workshop. Um, we've been working with Larry and his team over the past few years on leadership training, um, both on the student side for myself and then implementing it to the, the rest of the network, especially for the facility management team and new facility managers as they come on. We like to say we match our leadership style, the way we lead the network and manage the network to each facility manager. And we do that based on their, their functional level. So we say a high functioning team is one that makes big commitments and holds them 100% of the time. So those facility managers uh, that have been operating their facility for decades and are really good at reporting and great at keeping a tight schedule, we're able to be more of an empowerment centric uh, leadership style with them. We're able to just use more of an influence with them, lower touch points, set the vision, set our direction, set our, our intentions, let them do their thing. They know their facility better than we do. With newer facility managers, as there's turnover, as uh, people move on to different positions, we'll have more of a high touch, uh, control centric leadership style. I'll usually meet with them every couple of weeks as they get going for the first year or two. Um, this happened with uh, the new facility manager at UC San Diego. We've got a new facility manager at our uh, shaker truck fleet at U University of Texas Austin, and we're going to be having a new operations manager at UC Davis as well. So as these new folks come in, be working to train, uh, do the leadership training with them and, and have a more control-centric uh, leadership style with those folks so that everybody can be on the same page and that we have a, a open, fair and equitable scheduling environment for all of our researchers and keep this number of scheduling conflicts at zero. Also do a lot of work with them on uh, contingency planning, working through, we've, we've talked as a number of facilities have, 
looking at problems before they become urgent to solve them, while we have resources and time to solve those problems. So we'll, we'll talk with the, the PIs as well as the facility managers about large projects like this Tallwood um, shaking table project of what could go wrong and how do we avoid those problems? How do we put resources in place to mitigate their, their effects if they do happen anyway? And what resources and, and people and plans can we put in place for backups just in case everything goes sideways? So there's a lot of work on contingency planning, leadership training, as well as after action reviews, which gets us to feedback. So we want to be continually listening to our, our user community, to our operations managers, and to the NSF for how we're serving them, for how our scheduling operations are serving the community. And we've done that uh, every year as we've gone on and looking how well we're doing and creating uh, new ways to do that scheduling. We started out with relying very heavily on Microsoft Project. From a lot of feedback we got, it was too complex and it was a bit overkill for what we really needed to do. So we've created a new system that's host, hosted entirely on Design Safe at TAC, using a lot of their computing resources and programmers and those developers that Dan mentioned. They're fantastic and creating more of an in-house solution that is reducing the amount of time to create and update projects. It's reducing the amount of time to generate reports on how those projects are progressing and improving usability and user experience for, for the researchers who are looking to use our facilities, for the public who are looking to see how their tax dollars are being spent, and for the NSF as well to see how we're doing on the oversight of all of the operations. It also creates a common place for project data and scheduling information all in one place. These researchers are already putting their data up on Design Safe, and we don't want them to have to go somewhere else to look at the project schedule. So um, as we're continuing to evolve, our scheduling software, we're looking to ever increasingly relate it to what are these researchers actually doing on a daily basis and making sure that they don't have to go somewhere else to uh, interact with the schedule and only putting the data um, that is really needed uh, on there. So we took a lot of inspiration from the MagLab to create our new scheduling dashboard. Very simply, estimated start and end dates, because as, as Dan mentioned, as well as in uh, looking at supercomputing facilities, similarly with large infrastructure and, and large physical testing, most of our start and end dates are estimates until you get within about three months of this, that actual start date. So we keep things very flexible uh, because we know that once we get within that three months, we can keep those schedules pretty tight. Um, we talk about which facility it's going to be at. We go um, scheduling these things, we call them by event. So a particular experiment or a particular simulation or even just analysis of data that's taking staff time. Anytime a facility's staff or resources are used for a particular NSF award, we want to put that here. We also put blocks of time for non-NSF projects just so we know the facility is, is busy doing other things and not available uh, for NSF projects as, according to their uh, cooperative agreements. So very simple scheduling system. And a lot went into it to make it so simple. It's kind of like your uh, iPhone being designed. A whole lot went into it to make it that that mm -hmm. simple. So that was one of uh, our couple of lessons learned here. And uh, I think we're on our way to questions. So thanks, everybody. Me, hey, Dan. Thank you. Let me uh, open the floor. Uh, do we have a microphone? We do. So uh, is there any questions from the room? Yes, or response from Chess. I did not coordinate this with Joel, I promise you. So the question is succession planning. So Dan tells us about losing talent early in a career. We all know there's a, at the other end of the spectrum, we're losing talent uh, who are timing out of their careers or moving on to other things. Um, could you answer, could the facilities answer the question about succession planning, but not in a general sense, in a context of what should NSF do to help you structure proposals and awards so that you can do a good job of succession planning in a research infrastructure environment? Well, I can jump on that one. Uh, it is a topic that we talk about on OOI. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think there's anything the NSF could necessarily instigate to do it. Uh, I think it's on the responsibility falls on the facility. And, you know, our approach is to uh, try to find a mix of, you know, a succession plan with activities that could be allocated to, shall we say, a, a candidate successor or successors. So uh, putting some resources and tasking into the intention of having a 
candidate successors, should they be needed, is kind of as far as we go with it. So, uh, Krista, Dan, Joel. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing I would, I would add, and I just have to say that that the the comment about finding and keeping good people that you made down really resonates with what cha some of the challenges, frankly, we face right now with hiring into some of our projects. One of the things I think we try to do, uh, we're starting to think more actively across NCAR as a whole about succession planning, but if I think about just some of the projects I've worked on before or worked on now, one of the things we try to look at, similar to what you said, Paul, is um, when we're looking at project staffing, particularly, even if it's folks internally we want to bring onto a project team or we're looking at having to do an external hire, sometimes we will make an active decision to look for someone who is early to mid-career and could potentially grow into a position, mm -hmm. um, both on the on a project, a, a successor project, or sometimes within the institution. Um, I will say sometimes a challenge with that is, especially with some of these really large, complex projects, you may need a very specific skill set with someone who has a many years of expertise to come in and fill a role. Um, and so... I think in those cases where if we do need someone who maybe is more senior in a position category, say systems engineering, we will look at a hire in the context of if we bring this person in to work with us on this project, again, speaking about cross-institution integration, could we then, when their, their work on this project is over, will there be other opportunities that we have or we can create within the institution? But again, we also look at, can we bring in earlier career people and help them grow into an experience and grow into a longer-term career with us here? Yeah. Well, go ahead. I guess one of the things that we have a lot of um, physicists and homegrown equipment, and and, uh, uh, and so it's incredibly important to us to have a, a flow up through the organization where we hire in uh, the, the brightest young people we can and then try to keep giving them advancement opportunities and, and keeping so our people. So our most valuable, well, some of our very valuable employees are those that are mid-career and they, they worked in three or four different parts of the lab and come up so that it can actually supervise the different parts. And so, you know, retention and training and um, providing meaningful training and promotion opportunities is absolutely critical to a large facility. Yeah, and I agree with everything that's been said. Just to add a couple things. One is, um, you yeah, know, the the flip side of losing people at all stages of the pipeline is we actually see a lot of late career people sort of coming back who've made some money and decided that they spent the last two years figuring out how to up the monetization per user by 2.64%, and now they want to have a job that actually means something. Um, <laughs> and so we see a lot of people coming back in their 50s, right, and, and who want to work for us now. So that, that's that been, a, a, I, I guess, that you know, you can earn a career's worth of earnings in 15 years in the private sector. Um, and that might be a, a, a positive. But... Um, you know, there's what we do about it and then what the NSF does about it. I think there is actually something in the RIG, the, the Research Infrastructure Guide, um, where we show um, different levels of people in the succession plan behind, and I, I know we have a chart for this, and I assume it's in the RIG if we do, um, you know, who could take over today, you know, if, you know, somebody's hit by a bus, right? And then who is the sort of developmental person that's maybe three to five years away from that role and then a long-term um, sort of development? But certainly in the way I look at it, because, you know, People do come in and out, and that's one of the most unpredictable things, right, is to have, uh, you know, when we think about succession, is be a little less linear about it than NSF is, and to have, you know, so I have, for various roles, three or four candidates that we're thinking about developing and try and make sure they each get a little development in that direction, some of whom I'm like, well, they could be really good at this role for in five years, but it'd be a disaster if they got it tomorrow, right, if, uh, so who, you know, so I've thinking about people to step in, but then I'm like, well, one of these three people, should they still be here in seven years, will probably be the one to take over that role. Um, let's make sure they're all ready um, and not have such a, a linear view of here's first, second, third. <laughs> yeah, let, uh, just with a few minutes left, how about we uh, see if there's another question? Bob Blum, Ruben Observatory. Um, Great, great conversation, and I'd like to go back to this issue about retention, uh, and specifically in the software engineering area, which I think is just completely a unique situation. There's incentives throughout our academic institutions or our research institutions that bring good, bright people in to do lots of things, but this, this particular skill class just happens to be in the context of this commercial side that can pay outsized salaries, no matter how how many incentives we have. 
So I wanted to ask Dan, you know, when you talk about losing people to these outrageous salaries, which, you know, good for them, um, do, you, do you have a sense of how much more money you'd have to pay a few people to keep them? And is there anything, other than getting that money, is there anything that stops us from doing that? Is there anything at NSF or at Texas that says you just can't do that because X? Because it seems to me we should just ask that question. And if we're not willing to go to the next step, we should start thinking about other, other ways of, of securing our software engineering, which might be more commercial. Yeah, and I, I, so that's a mini-pronged question. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, sort of subtleties to it that I could go into. Um, but uh, I think it's, you know, the, if we got competitive, the competitors would just go higher, right, <laughs> on salaries. So I think trying to win strictly on dollars is a losing battle. I think, um, and I've seen this in some economic analysis, right? Yeah, th there is a there is a minimum acceptable, right, that we have to make sure we hit, right, because there's a point where you you actively drive people out, um, uh, and uh, there are no barriers to keeping it higher uh, that, that I'm aware of. I mean, there's, there's HR challenges in terms of titles and stuff like that, but almost always if you're creative enough, you can find ways around those things. Um, but the fact is I just can't do you know, with indirect costs, seven hundred thousand dollars in FTE. I mean, <laughs> for for senior developers and have a viable project. So, um, so I think we do need to pay more. We are trying to pay more, um, but I think winning straight on salary is just not the the way to go. Um, the uh, um, and by the way, the big cure for this will be a recession. So, um, which will help a lot. Nvidia went into a hiring freeze last week. Intel did layoffs. Dell did layoffs. All the cryptocurrency guys are laying people off. Right? It's it's going to cool down a bit, but and it and it will run in cycles again. But the uh, but I think part of it is just the way we sort of value and treat those things. Um, and there's you know sort of different classes of developers, and even the sort of PhD scientists building simulation codes is one thing. But then. You know, we have programmers who build the scheduling software for Dan Zayner, right, for Nary, um, and they sort of get treated as, you know, support people and service center people and not sort of as research peers. Um, and I think, you know, because I've, I've seen this happen with some folks, right, if you can get them to the right place where they feel like they're a valued part of the team and they're contributing to science and contributing to the mention and not just the person who's getting yelled at because this bug has caused this pipeline to go down again um, all the time, uh, in the way faculty would never say treat each other, um, the, uh, uh, then that makes a huge difference, right? And then suddenly it's like, well, I'm in, you know, I'm part of the mission, I'm in public service, and, uh, and I accept that I'm going to make less money. So I think we need to pay enough, which is probably more than we're paying now. Um, and so we, we need to have the conversation about enough, but I think saying we're going to pay what Google pays to do cloud AI work it's just not practical. Um, so, but but we can treat people with a lot more respect you know, in those roles, and that would help a ton. So. Well, thank you all. Uh, that's a wrap. It's 11:30, and we're ahead of lunch, so I know what that means. Uh, thanks very much.